I, I sit and join you. Actually, that was the conclusion of a McKinsey uh, research that was published uh, late in September, and seeing actually, given how much precisely the Chinese were you know, hopping their uh, innovation game, they said the CEO globally uh, will have to focus on faster, cheaper, and more global R&D with a stronger role for China. Also, second point, consider taking bigger bets on the China research platform to accelerate the pace of project development to match local competitors, and consider leveraging Chinese talents as a critical R&D success factor globally. So I'm going to sit with you. And I actually just wanted to uh, maybe ask you to, to react to this uh, sort of conclusion, which could be as well a sort of roadmap, but just globally as a, an introduction. Well, uh, clearly, China is on the map for all companies. And I can tell you that for Fear Unique, it has been a, a game changer. OK, Eve, <laughs> can you pass the mic? So China, uh, for DS, obviously, China is a very important market. China is the second uh, car premium market in the world, just behind the US. Uh, so it is uh, an extremely important market for us. I think it's also leading a lot of changes uh, in the automotive industry, but we'll come back to that with uh, uh, the rise of electric uh, and the rise of, uh, of connected vehicles. So a big game changer in the industry, that's for sure. Okay. I'd say, especially in Europe, we need to change the perception on China. It's uh, definitely where we can see that China is now moving from a low-cost mass production country in top premium engineering and top premium quality country. And uh, easy to say, if we keep the perception, we will be overtaken in many ways. Okay. Just wanted, in fact, to... Um, the, the reason why I did gather, actually, uh, Oliver, Eve, and, and Joel, the, the point was, okay, uh, China Connect is not a, a, a French, I would say, Chinese, you know, conference and gathering. Our idea is as well to really address, you know, the Europe context, is, if possible. Uh, I think the point was here also to, to get the players in industries that are really strategic. I mean, Joel representing the e-commerce activity in a hugely strategic industry, which is cosmetic. Uh, DS Automobile with Eve, actually, we know how much the automotive industry is something vibrant, and with the Chinese having very big ambitions in competing also precisely in electric cars uh, versus the US market, which is the leading one. And uh, with Oliver, actually, there was a, a double entry for me. The first one was that uh, a year ago or so, they decided to join Tmall. And when he considered Leica, which is one of the moves, I would say historical, authentic brands, high-end premium brands, that was also one of the questions I wanted to raise. And also, for sure, the collaboration with Huawei. Huawei, the third you know, smartphone global brand in the world. And this is something that we wanted to share today. Um, I just wanted to ask for you a, a first anecdote. I'm going to ask for a second micro, please. Can we have more? Um, I wanted to have, yes, given your experience in the country, how long you've been uh, at the head of your companies, but a, a very personal anecdote in terms of, yeah, when you first got to China, whether a meeting or something, what really, you know, uh, what did you experience that was, you know, standing apart that you just keep in mind because it was, you know. Well, to get Fear Unique into China, I thought, you know, the difficulties would be uh, negotiating a deal, uh, agreeing on a pricing strategy, very complicated stuff. And in the end, what I found is that uh, the uh, only difficulty we had was what would be the look and feel of the site. Um, if you look at the three CEOs today, uh, without talking to each other, we are all in a blue suit and a blue shirt. <laughs> so we know exactly what good taste is about. Uh, but when you talk to Chinese, um, our sleek and uh, kind of neutral um, look and feel of the site didn't appeal to the Chinese people because uh, in China, you want very flashy colors. So that was my biggest surprise, is that uh, the sense of aesthetics in China is quite different. Okay. Uh, on my side, I've always been um, amazed by the, um, uh, the, the fascination uh, of, uh, of Chinese for celebrities. And uh, I recall a special day uh, where we were 
uh, at the Beijing Motor Show in uh, 2014. And um, we were working with, uh, with Sophie Marceau as an Egeri of the DS brand in China. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the rumor that Sophie would be on uh, the DS booth started to spread in the, in the motor show. And uh, 10 minutes later, uh, you couldn't walk on the DS booth anymore because everybody was packed waiting for Sophie to come. 15 minutes later, uh, you couldn't walk around the DS booth because all the, the approaches way to get to the booth were fully packed with people. And 15 minutes later, I had the people from the booth around me complaining that we were destroying their booth with people walking around waiting for Sophie to come to the booth. Uh, and that was an amazing experience uh, for me. Um, and I think this is something that is very powerful in, um, in, in China. And, uh, and it's, it's very, it's a very nice, it was a very nice experience. So I just learned at the uh, Huawei presentation on Sunday that greenery is the color of the year, so I'm going to buy me a second shirt, so I learned that. Um, I remember one of my first meetings I've had in China where we've had a very professional type of a project meeting. And we came to the point, which was very professional in terms of how we get to the kind of final conclusion there. And we get to the point where we say, okay, so how many, how many resources you bring in? And I was just like, well, I would start with three. And I said, okay, we bring 300. So uh, what we definitely should discuss today is also what is the level of dynamics, the level of agility, and the level of quality resources in China uh, that we can see right now, and where's the kind of um, where's the kind of interaction point? Where can we really connect the dots? And speed is something where I say, well, I think there is a new definition of speed coming from China now. Okay. Um, you have uh, DS Automobile has been in China since 2012, something. Um, Feel Unique is uh, is even a, a more recent venture, but Leak has been there for quite a while. Um, can you tell us how much? Uh, the Chinese market represent for you on your overall business, actually? So, uh, China last year represented 16% uh, of our business globally. Um, we have uh, established the brand in China, as you uh, mentioned, back in, uh, in 2012. Uh, we have in China uh, a network of uh, about 100 uh, point of sales covering the top 60 uh, cities in the country. Um, and China is a very uh, important market for us. Um, in fact, uh, we have established full operation in China in a JV with uh, creating uh, a plant, an R&D center, and launching free cars in less than uh, 18 months. And this has been a, a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous ride. And um, I have to say that today, uh, our plant in, uh, in China, which is based in, uh, in Shenzhen, is probably the best plant of the group in terms of quality. Uh, and I think this is something that is very important uh, to have in mind because today I'm using uh, some of our Chinese operations uh, KPIs to benchmark and challenge our European operations. Uh, and I think this says something to your point about the, the, the changing nature uh, of, uh, of China. C can you mention one of those KPIs, for example? The the quality of the plant, the quality of the, of the cars coming out of our Shenzhen plant is uh, among the very best uh, plants we have in the world, if not the best plant in the world. Uh, how far does France rank? <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of plants in France, so France would rank second very quickly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oliver? Actually, we are kind of dealing businesses in China now for more than 60 years. Um, having said that, we were running that business uh, through, a, through a partner there and we just kind of stopped that kind of collaboration uh, almost a year ago because we felt like um, in, in China we are seen as a real luxury brand and we need to really treat our customers on that luxury level there and uh, you need to run the business on your own. And um, clearly also the fact that we saw a lot of gray market activities coming from China but this was truly based on not having the different types of sales channels under control, uh, which is something that we put a lot of effort towards, actually, and we're really gaining a lot of momentum here, so this is good. And then, obviously, when we started the uh, technical collaboration with Huawei, it was very clear that this is a major statement for kind of a made-in-Germany company, craftsmanship, high-level premium quality uh, manufacturing, but the major part was 
our DNA for more than 103 years is optical engineering expertise and really world class, I would say even the best in the world. And to keep that only in traditional cameras is not the right thing to do because we'd like to connect with the people that are clearly dealing with their smartphones now. And we said, well, let's get together and turn the smartphone in becoming a real respected camera. And that's exactly what we're kind of achieving already here. Um, and quite frankly, I mean, China is now around 15% of our total revenues, 85% of our revenues are outside Germany, and I expect that China is um, becoming the biggest region, I would say, in three to four years for the company. Currently, it's still the US. And w when did you open first in China? That was a while ago. Well, we started, we started our own entity with an own team there uh, in November 2015. That means before that, we've been fully depending on a partner located yeah. in Hong Kong. Um, and we opened up our first uh, store in Shanghai. It's now eight months ago. And immediately it turned up to become one of the most successful stores we have in the world. And fortunately, what we can say, because we have a little bit the perception of being an old brand, but uh, the average uh, client we have in China is uh, around 35 years, which is amazing if you can just compare it to the prices you have to pay for like a camera system. <laughs> so uh, it also there is a certain kind of an indication where we can really say, okay, this is the this is the future future region also for the company. And Joel. So we uh, opened our Chinese site uh, exactly 18 months ago. Um, currently, the Chinese site does 15% of our business, and uh, that represents $1.5 million a month. Um, the truth is that two years ago, uh, China was not even on our strategic roadmap. Our shareholders are a private equity fund that specializes in taking a leading uh, company from one country in Europe and making it a European leader. And they were not even listening to me talking about China, uh, even though I was telling them that China is the country with the highest uh, penetration for consumption of cosmetics through e-commerce. And fortunately, we met this entrepreneur uh, who has a company called Azoya that uh, provides uh, turnkey e-commerce solutions for cross-border. And uh, we signed up very quickly. We got operations ready in three months. And as I said, uh, after uh, 18 months, it's already 15% of our business. Mm -hmm. uh, all of you actually uh, mentioned, or Oliver, you mentioned the, the problem of copy <laughs> and fakes. I mean, uh, immediately, necessarily, there's something I wanted to raise as well. I mean, cosmetic, we know how much. I mean, they are uh, amazing when we're talking whether Taobao or many other Jume websites where you can find an enormous quantity of fake products. You've been copied. You decide as well to join a marketplace. Okay, what's your, what's your, you know, what's your attitude towards this? I mean, that's a choice and a decision you made, so consciously. But what's your opinion versus that? We didn't context? have we didn't have so f so much any kind of issues with regard to copy product. It was more about gray market activities, mm -hmm. which means. Um, not managing sales channels properly always lead to a gray market, but this is kind of something where I feel like it's already sorted out. Um, to be quite frank, uh, try and open a Leica camera and try and open a Leica lens. Uh, you, honestly, I think it's potentially easier to copy anything else than this. It's a very complicated thing here. Um, but again, what I have experienced so far, and I know that from a very, very deep understanding of what's going on at Huawei is that the level of Chinese engineering, it's amazing. Um, the quality of the engineering people, outstanding. And I would rather go and say, still in Europe we're discussing what is to be expected coming from Silicon Valley. I would say what is to be expected coming from China. And uh, I used to work for Microsoft for six years and I can tell you also on the software side what I see coming from China. It's awesome, it's outstanding, and it's clearly usability and, 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 and user-focused. So um, this is where I really see a, a fantastic momentum you can see and get from China now. Cross-border is thriving um, because of copy. Uh, Chinese consumers are very afraid of putting uh, beauty cosmetics product on their hair or their skin uh, because of all the copy. And actually, uh, I think part of our success is completely based on that. Uh, the Chinese consumer is ready to wait one or two weeks to get a delivery because it comes from London and it's obviously not copy because it comes from London. Uh, and that has been a, a major factor of success for us. Mm -hmm. 
And we even go as far as not being on the platforms, uh, the marketplaces uh, until now, because this confusion between fakes and authentic products, and we have only done direct uh, relationship to the consumer, and this is building up our reputation in China. And would you say that that's for sure you will not join a marketplace? I never say never, but yeah. so far we have managed to grow a business uh, by going direct. Okay. And any plans also since stocking retail in going offline, being represented for you know department stores or uh, having your own space? Not on our agenda. No. We are really a digital company and uh, the cost of doing uh, offline business is, uh, is not for us. Yeah. <laughs> Automobile. Also, an industry where you can find amazing fake brands. <laughs> I mean, or copy, I mean, brands will just copy uh, ama amazing other brands. It's, uh, it's always surprising no, the, to me. The, this has not been a big issue for us in, yeah. in, in China, frankly. Um, we, we have had marginal uh, copy products on, on uh, accessories for our cars, but nothing, nothing really significant. significant. No. No problem, so no issues. No issues. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually, when we're talking um, selling to the Chinese, uh, what is sure is that, and specifically maybe in the automotive industry and the luxury and premium business as a whole, we know how much Chinese consumers are a lot and way younger than the counterparts in the West. Uh, how, how much can you say about you know, each of your uh, businesses? I can um, I can get started. Uh, to, for us, customers are very very different between uh, Western uh, and uh, and China. Uh, there are difference in age, as you rightly point out. Um, in in Western Europe, the average age of a new car buyer, uh, and that's not DS specific figure, that's market figure, is 54 years old, uh, which is always a surprising figure. Uh, in our case, we're a little younger. Uh, we're more uh, in the late 40s, but in China, uh, our customers uh, in average are 34. Right. So it's basically 20 years different uh, with the average uh, age of the, of the market. Um, but what is very interesting is that beyond that difference uh, of age, which is huge uh, and has huge implication on our marketing, by the way, um, the, the customers are very close in what they expect from our product. Uh, in fact, um, our customers, uh, both in Western Europe and in China, are people who want to express some of their personality uh, with the cars we sell. This is something uh, very strong at DS, where we believe that uh, personalization, customization of the car is central. Uh, if you take a DS3 today to take a car that is more well-known uh, in Europe, uh, we have two million uh, possible uh, configuration of the car when you play with all the colors, all the uh, attributes. This is something central to the brand and this is something our Western customers as well as our Chinese customers expre expect very strongly. Uh, and also because uh, the DS brand is so much linked uh, to, uh, to Paris, to the French luxury uh, know-how, uh, we have customers who always have um, a sense of uh, I would say of arts, of culture. Uh, that's why we have a, a worldwide partnership with Le Louvre, uh, which the Chinese understand very well uh, and, like, uh, and like very much. So I would say a very big difference in age, but in terms of uh, taste, in terms of uh, personalities, uh, a, a, very, a lot of proximities actually between our customers around the world. So a um, few years ago, actually, we took as a company a very, very conscious, conscious uh, strategic decision. We figured out that we had around two-thirds of our global net sales based on our Leica M, which is comparable to a Porsche 911. And we said from a pure product perspective, um, we need to change the product portfolio in order to get access to other age groups as well. So we put more and different product into the product portfolio and we took that decision globally and we exceeded with that. It means we have now by far more uh, users of a Leica camera below 40 years. Now what happened with China, and this is the kind of uh, result of that portfolio strategy change, but also actually our activities in China is that we see that um, the young Chinese consumers are 
so well informed about global brands. They are so kind of um, committed to some certain kind of brands and I would like to be in touch with these brands. And I'll give you an example. Um, you might say, isn't camera an old traditional type of uh, tool? In some ways it is, because most of the time you're taking pictures with your smartphones, as we all do that, right? But there is a moment in life when you really say, I would rather go and say, let's have a smartphone and a top premium camera system in combination. If there's anything in the middle, actually, this is out of your reach, this is out of your interest. So we said from a niche perspective, we have exactly the right positioning. Now what happens actually is that we see we don't have, even have to explain the, the beauty and the cultural aspect of photography anymore because all the young people's raised up with that photography. And now we can say, let's combine tools here. So having a product decision is one thing. The second thing is definitely is that Chinese people are kind of setting trends now globally. Mm -hmm. And we said, we, we got a lot of feedback from Chinese young consumers. They said, well, look, I can carry any other camera, but no one will take notice. The moment I carry a Leica camera, people start talking to me. And I felt like, oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that feedback. <laughs> Where are your, you know, the buyers of those Leica uh, products and cameras? I mean, are they, you would say that they, they, they concentrate in major tier cities? In well, Shanghai, first of all, I, I'm really sharing what you just said with regard to the different types of average age groups in the United States, in Europe, where we are kind of average, so 45, 55 as a major cluster. Um, China is different for a simple reason. There is access to money in China also among young people, and we should not underestimate the power of the local domestic market in China. I mean, we're talking about a domestic market with a population of 1.5 billion. We're talking about kind of a mid-class society now, around 300 million. I mean, it's huge. It's, it's a heavy market. Um, and the key access was also the collaboration with Huawei, I can tell. Because this was kind of having a different perception of photography. And yeah, starting with a smartphone, it's fantastic. Combining it with a Leica was kind of, a, I think, a really smart move. Uh, and this is where we get access to more and more people there in China. It's fantastic. And we really stressed the point about it's, all, it's, not, a, it's not a brand collaboration. It's a deep technical collaboration. That means we both are so committed to achieve the next level in engineering. And also this culturally actually is kind of a different statement and just doing some kind of brand corporation thing here. So you have to go into what is really required in China and that's now premium and engineering. Joy? Okay, our Chinese business is not that different from uh, what we would have in UK or France. Um, the age group is slightly younger, maybe mid-20s, when in UK it would be end of 20s. Um, but clearly we are addressing the younger generation of uh, beauty shoppers. Uh, geographically, we um, serve consumers that are in uh, big cities, but also in remote areas, because uh, some consumers find it practical to shop online, and some consumers have no other choice but buy online to get uh, their favorite product. Um, Category-wise, um, China is very strong in makeup and skincare. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, hair care and fragrance is uh, much more limited, much, much smaller. Um, I think um, where the difference is, and maybe we'll talk about that later, is on the marketing. How we uh, reach consumers, what kind of uh, tools we use, uh, and how we've built a successful business uh, from a marketing point of view. Precisely, the, actually, that was the transition in terms of localization. Uh, all your brands are global, actually, uh, by definition, yours. Um, and when we, we're talking China, we're talking localization, how much do we need to adapt your offer in terms of product or services to your target audience, etc. So how much do you deal with that and how much your adaptation to the Chinese market and Chinese customers differ from the job that you're doing maybe elsewhere in thousand countries, I would say, I don't know, South America, for example. Maybe I start? And of course, we're talking digital as well. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that still internally, we have a lot of very intense debate about, is it okay to say Leica is a luxury brand? Because we have people in Germany who say, no, we should not be luxury, we should be premium. Premium is the difference. And my point of view is very simple here. I said, if Chinese people look at Leica as a luxury brand, that's okay because it's all about the client's business. Um, and 
obviously, I don't believe that you can run the business in China successfully with a full centralized approach. You need to have local entity there, you need to have the understanding of the local culture, and local culture in China, by the way, also depends on the different types of regions you have. There is not one single uh, Chinese culture, there are so many areas. How can you really manage that from a uh, headquarter being located in Europe or the United States? There is no way. But at the same time, it's also important to say we need to balance out local specific requirement and needs and what is the global part of the brand. And that means we started to have that ongoing conversations internally and it's very fruitful. What we have experienced as well is that the learning curve in Chinese teams is really outstanding because the willingness to learn, the ability to learn, it's based on I'm still very thirsty and hungry to get better. While if you have sometimes the same discussions, for instance, in a European environment, people say, well, I know how it works. And that's a completely different approach. I'd rather go and say, let's start think new, rather than telling me, well, I experienced the last 20 years like this and this. And this is also where agility and speed comes in. But you, uh, to my understanding, you need to really have a very strong local team to really approach the Chinese market in the right way. Thank you. Yeah, same, same, same view here. Um, I think localization is, is central. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, I believe uh, China is going to play a central role in the uh, reshaping of the automotive industry that is happening at the moment. Uh, the automotive industry uh, is switching towards uh, hybrid and electric on one hand, and it's, uh, it's switching towards uh, autonomous driving, connected cars and autonomous driving on the other hand. And I think in both areas, uh, China today is a leading force uh, in terms of electric and hybrid. Uh, China has made uh, a very uh, bold decisions uh, in terms of accelerating the move. Uh, in the case of DS, we will be launching uh, our hybrid technology uh, on the Chinese market first, and it will, be, it will be industrialized in China first and launched in the Chinese market first. So we're taking the China first approach and then roll out to the rest of the world what we will have implemented in, in China, uh, which I think is the right way to do it. Um, in terms of uh, uh, connectivity and autonomous driving, uh, we see also very a lot of dynamism and, and momentum uh, at the moment in China. We have the chance of being located um, with our plant and R&D center in the Shenzhen region, which is obviously uh, uh, the center of the world for many of those technologies. Uh, this is a big opportunity for us uh, on which we're working uh, to, uh, to make sure that we leverage it um, appropriately. So definitely uh, localization is fundamental and I think uh, we need uh, in our Western uh, approaches to switch to uh, how do we leverage China for the rest of the world as opposed to, okay, we're gonna do something here and send it to China, and uh, if we do it right, it will work. I, I think the, it has just changed. Okay, so you're right in the conclusion of McKinsey. <laughs> so at Feel Unique, we're trying to, to achieve a fine balance between uh, localizing our business, but at the same time, remaining very much an English site that is serving Chinese consumers. So that means we are obviously adapting the assortment to match the, uh, the taste of uh, Chinese uh, consumers, but that means offering hard to find, uh, sometimes niche brands that uh, we are the only one selling to China. Um, but at the same time, we have a call center in Shenzhen that uh, answers customers' uh, requests uh, uh, in Chinese, because uh, without that, we wouldn't be a proper e-commerce site. So uh, this fine balance is, uh, is um, done through an international team in London and a local team in, uh, in Shenzhen. And we recognize that uh, the local team has got the expertise in terms of uh, marketing in particular. In terms of um, you know, digital platforms, precisely social media tools, etc., I remember in 2015, uh, I invited Arnaud working with you in China, heading the uh, Chinese business of DS Automobile. And they had been, I think the automotive industry has been um, really pioneering a lot of things into e-commerce in China and, I w and also the way they, they were leveraging social media. And I remember DS was... Uh, really leveraging WeChat as an amazing tool to build their own community and of course driving people to stores, etc. There was a very dynamic actually use of these tools and I wanted 
for all of you to know, you know, how much, which, which was the one you're the most fan of and on which, you know, your community is the most engaged with and what do you think? And uh, how much do you explore actually this environment that is very challenging in terms of, yes, uh, you now have pillars that are becoming, you know, most good destination, I would say, but really you need to also have a look at what's going on elsewhere. There are other options and precisely on, you know, in targeting high net worth individuals and more, you know, demanding consumers. So how, how much, how far do you go into looking at those opportunities, in fact? Well, talking digital, I would say there are kind of two types of platforms that, to my understanding, really stand out in, in China. One is Tmall and the other one is WeChat. Um, look, we have made a huge investment the last five years into running Leica stores all over the world, and we're talking about offline stores, and you're right, it's a, it's a heavy investment you need to make. It's a heavy investment in terms of real estate. It's a heavy investment in terms of staff. Uh, and it's a heavy investment in terms of uh, ensuring that you have all the data points given and provided to you centrally on a, on a second base, put like that. Um, but we are not so experienced yet in terms of uh, running own digital um, selling platforms and e-commerce platforms. But then obviously we said, well, with the introduction of the own entity in China, it's a fantastic opportunity uh, to deal with Tmall because it's still a kind of a closed region there, right? I mean, if you go with Amazon, then you know you're already global, but with Tmall it felt like, okay, we go there. Um, and we always need to keep an eye on the fact that, yes, we are luxury. That means, yes, we need to really also balance out our pricings in the market. Uh, we need to ensure that a new product is not getting discounted because that's a devaluation of a luxury brand, and then you would have potentially two great years in terms of revenues, but you're losing margin, and we need margin to reinvest into retail and stuff like that. So we made a very conscious decision there having pilot projects with Tmall, and the first results were really good, not only in terms of selling high volumes, but the way products got sold. The second story I would like to share is that I was with Microsoft for six years, and I was kind of being an ambassador for, look guys, it's the end of emails. There will be something else where we're going to communicate. This was kind of, I was always sharing it, right? So I've been with Huawei in collaboration. I felt like, so why, why are you guys not answering my emails and they were just looking at me because we don't write emails anymore. And I said, well, okay, there is a case study. And I said, what are you doing? Yeah, we are in, on WeChat. And I felt like WeChat, it's the Chinese version of WhatsApp. And I felt like, oops, no, it's a completely different experience. WeChat is the number one communication con connection platform I've ever experienced anywhere else. You can do any kind of purchase. You can do any type of communication. It's just outstanding. It's really outstanding. And it's a number one marketing platform, as we all know. So uh, dealing with WeChat is also, for me, a completely new experience. And I thought I'm pretty digital here, but I really figured out, no, I'm not digital enough. So also, this is something that you should um, take advantage of. But it needs to get you into a different thinking mode. I can um, I can only uh, uh, confirm that WeChat is, is is central to the business today. It's it's I would say one of the uh, natural way of doing business in China in many ways in marketing in uh, uh, interacting with customers in a social way and so on. Um, what we have uh, been doing recently is is very interesting um, in the in the automotive industry in China at the moment. You have a big uh, growth of the uh, financed sales uh, in in uh, for for quite some times, cars have been paid cash uh, by the Chinese customers, and uh, we see now a, a rise of the uh, financing uh, cars uh, by by banks or leasers, uh, very much like what we have in uh, many other regions of the world. And in fact, uh, Tmall has developed a, a very interesting uh, algorithm to score uh, the customers in terms of uh, of credit. And uh, uh, working jointly with them, we were able to uh, leverage the, uh, the Tmall technology to be able to make a decision on whether uh, we would um, uh, engage a, a loan uh, for a customer to buy a car uh, based on their uh, credit scoring, which is uh, basically in, in milliseconds. Um, in, here in Europe, you would probably need, uh, at best, uh, a few minutes if you are very well organized to determine the credit scoring of, of an individual connecting on your website. Uh, thanks to what we've done with Tmall, you can really do it on the fly. And that's, that's an amazing uh, business tool 
which were uh, launching at the moment very successfully. So uh, we see a lot of innovation, in fact, coming into the market from the uh, uh, Chinese uh, e-business companies. And uh, we, here again, we expect to be able to spread those kind of things around the planet. So Philunique uses a variety of uh, digital marketing techniques. Um, one is uh, KOL, the um, <coughs> key opinion leaders, um, kind of local celebrities that uh, can really speak about a product. Uh, it's great, but you need to really manage your supply chain accordingly because suddenly you have a peak of demand on one particular SKU. Um, we use WeChat uh, with a QR code uh, in the WeChat post, uh, meaning that uh, it's really click to, click to buy. Um, we also use gaming. Uh, our uh, customer is young and they love uh, to do uh, little games. Uh, recently we had uh, three characters. You had to fill their lips as quickly as possible to receive uh, a gift uh, voucher. We also do affiliates uh, and uh, Weibo posts. I think key for us is uh, to develop natural traffic, organic traffic, because we don't have the margin of a brand. We are a retailer, so it's very important that some of our business is done without spending uh, marketing money. Can I add one more thing here, just listening to you? Um, if we look into most of the European manufacturers, actually, we have created the last decades a culture of engineering based on let's create new standards on the industry side and let's, out of this, take advantage of patents. Um, culturally, that was all okay, but now dealing with Chinese engineering people, I can tell you, they have a completely different type of understanding. It's all about open source, it's all about sharing. No, it's not about copying, it's about sharing. That means if I'm going into an engineering project, I take advantage of the openness of some of the Chinese engineering folks. And this also ends up with higher results in terms of speed and higher results in quality. Yes, you might say, but that also means that I also have to open up my books, yes. But coming from the software industry, that's the nature of the software industry the last 40 years anyhow. Um, and listening to you, what you just said, like developing projects in China for the rest of the world, it's potentially something what is underlining what I just said. But this is also kind of different perception. I talked to some of my engineering people and I said, well, my dream is to create the next ISO standard. And I said, my dream is to skip that because that means that we can have at least four or five different development cycles in the same time frame. And I would rather go for the development cycles now. We need to move fast and we need to be very agile. Otherwise, we'll become a nice place in Europe for tourists. <laughs> if not yet. <laughs> um, no, but perfect. I mean, just to, actually, I think, close uh, the, the, this panel precisely. We, we've talked about it a little bit uh, at the very beginning, but again, um, taking your point now, um, there's been a lot of idées reçues, uh, you know, preconceptions precisely about, um, I would say, Chinese brands and collaboration with the Chinese. And discussing with all of you when we were preparing this talk, I mean, there was one common things on which all of you agreed is precisely your experience had been amazing somehow. And uh, so I wanted you, you know, just as a conclusion precisely, um, how and how far will these collaboration, depending if it's on a product, you know, base or like Huawei, and maybe you, you plan to do that for other industries, but how do you think this will impact your organization globally? You said a few things, but a little bit more largely in terms of, you know, we can talk talent, we can talk R&D precisely. Um, what is it right now? What's the status of this collaboration? And, you know, what's ahead? You know, I think we, we, we talked about it already quite, quite a lot. I, I personally right. see China as being an opportunity to uh, develop things that will be uh, fast and innovative. Uh, working with the Chinese ecosystem and then being able to leverage this uh, globally. And uh, I mentioned already uh, electric as being one of the central uh, theme for that. Um, I think it is very uh, it is very true. I think uh, connected cars is also an important topic. With connected cars, there would be I would have one one uh, reserve, which is the issue uh, we didn't touch touch about digital, which is the Chinese Great Firewall, uh, which 
honestly makes it a little <coughs> complicated for uh, global companies like us to fully leverage the power of, um, of platforms, of digital platforms across the world. Uh, because you always have to uh, address that, and, and, and that, is, that is a complication, uh, quite a complication, actually. Uh, but I hope we can overcome that. And, um, and then if we can overcome that, frankly, uh, China has a, has a huge potential to transform and accelerate our technological cycles uh, around the world. And that's, for me, one of the biggest opportunities we have of course, after the size of the market and the, and the, and the demand that uh, the Chinese market uh, has globally and the weight it has globally, that's for sure. Joël? Yes, um, China is transforming a lot of our company. Um, we used to deal only with the uh, UK teams of the brands, then the European teams. Now we are talking with the worldwide teams and uh, I'm going to Asia to speak, to speak and meet with all the brands because obviously there are still a lot of brands that are not allowing us to sell to China so there is a huge potential there. It's also um, uh, impacting our marketing approach. We are learning new ways of uh, recruiting consumers in China that maybe can be uh, transferred to uh, the way we do it in, uh, in Europe. And finally it's uh, opening the appetite of our shareholders and team in terms of international expansion. So, uh, Laure, if you want to uh, launch uh, India Connect or Iran Connect, I would be happy to, uh, yeah. to come and attend. Thanks very much. <laughs> I would see uh, the opportunity. Where actually, um, as a company, the moment you decide to be a global player and the moment you decide to start a kind of a digital transformation is definitely the moment you should have a very strong muscle in China. As a conclusion, <laughs> thanks very much. I wanted to, to ask, maybe you have questions, take the opportunity. Uh, I will introduce Normandy Maiden, that uh, many of you, uh, I've seen this previous year, as she's going to run this conference. She's going to be your master of ceremonies, so really bridging the talks. And I just leave her precisely the opportunity. If you have any questions, just to ask Oliver, Eve, and Joel. Anyone? Yes. Micro for uh, Calvin. Thanks, Calvin. Um, gentlemen, good morning, and thank you for the insight for um, sharing. I, I was just wondering, maybe particularly on uh, Oliver's case, because you know, just being a Chinese and coming from our perception, maybe wrong. German companies are rather um, in a more routine uh, kind of business, and especially when you're in the engineering field, you want to look at processes, SOPs, and all that. I'm just wondering how your experience been that you've been talking through, you know, either with Huawei or with your own uh, experience running your own offline stores, for example. H how does it create the changes or the impact to your organization? Because I would imagine that's huge, right? I was talking to David next to me. like. I can imagine, because I have a lot of friends working for German companies, they, they all struggle in a way, that adapting, right? I, I like that. Actually, there are two things you need to consider. We are a very small, premium niche company. We have 1,600 employees worldwide. So now dealing with a big corporation like Huawei is, per se, a kind of a challenge for our organization. Um, to be quite frank, when it comes to engineering, um, there's a lot of kind of sharing the same type of procedures between Leica and Huawei. That's the easy part. I guess the most complicated part is when you then obviously accelerate the product into the market via sales and marketing, where still a lot of Chinese companies are in a learning curve, let's put it that way. Uh, and this is where a little bit, some of the things are getting a little bit chaotic, yeah? But uh, also here I say, we will get through it, and they always ask, they're always asking for advice. They're very open, really, to take your point of view. Uh, but it's a different type of collaboration. I mean, I, I'm, very, I'm very familiar with dealing with a lot of different types of working cultures, Korean and Japanese, but I've never seen that type of openness to say, well, look, this is what we can deliver, this is what we'd like to achieve, and we need your help to, to get there. This is the type of conversation you should have. And from a German perspective, uh, I feel like the Made in Germany potentially is stronger than ever, but if it's only engineering, it's something that is not enough anymore. That means we also have to learn that manufacturing is fantastic, engineering is outstanding, but we need to learn how to run business on a global level. 
And this is where our learning curve is now really going through the roof. Thank you. Another question? Can I just quickly add, um, I'm David from um, 360. Um, uh, to um, Olivier again. Um, whenever I listen to CEO talked about their business, especially for China, um, I, I pick up my, micro, um, my phone and then quick, quickly run an index. Um, there seemed to be a peak uh, for Leica cameras on the 23rd of February. Have you launched a new products or something that your search is, wow, like 500 times more? <laughs> Only 500 times. <laughs> Should be more. I mean, no, percentage-wise. <laughs> no, to, be, to be quite frank, if I look into our last eight weeks, I'm personally being very proud being in that company. I mean, we launched the new Leica M uh, in January. And again, it feels like launching the new 911. And now we have launched, together with Huawei, the P10 and the P10 Plus. This is the reason why. And to be quite frank, have you seen the feedback on the product? It's amazing. And it's amazing because we put so much effort from a technology perspective, from an optical perspective, into the product. And I said also to Richard Yu, who's running the, um, as a CEO, that, that consumer business for Huawei, I said, well, next time you should take a statement that says, the P9 already is, 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 is seen as a fantastic product in the world. Maybe you're not comparing your P series anymore with other competitors, maybe you compare it with a, pre a previous version because this is clearly underlying what is exactly the technology step these guys are taking. And look into the product also from a cloud-based solutions and software solutions they are servicing you with. Outstanding. But it's just one product and the next is already kind of work in progress. This is something where I'm so pleased with. So the last eight weeks have been very exciting for Leica, I can say. And to be quite frank, we are so proud of our 103 years of tradition and history, but quite frankly, we are even more proud about that we have a nice future projection now. Great, I should throw away my LG and get a <laughs> P10 then. L what? <laughs> well, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>